Now we start the second uh, lecture. The speaker is uh, Dennis or uh, <laughs> WH Show Blue. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he will talk about holotropic stress tensor of the colored Lipschitz space time and Henry Black holes. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks for inviting me uh, in this seminar. So today I will talk about this. Uh, holographic stress tensor of color Lipschitz space times and airy black holes. The title is kind of long, and this is an kind of an old problem. Uh, I, uh, I started in PhD, and now I had some time and come back to it uh, last year. So, and let me first go over the contents. So I will first give you a short introduction of Lipschitz space times and previous works and models and my motivation. Then I will review the einstein yang Mies solution that I found before in 2014. Then on top of this, uh, I will give you how to uh, construct a variational well-defined action for this einstein yang Mies model. And following this uh, well-defined action, uh, I will give the definition and construction of non-relativistic boundary stress tensor. And this, uh, for this one, I will follow Ross and uh, Simon Ross and uh, Saremi's construction. And for the next uh, chapters will be about the application of this stress tensor. I will check whether this is uh, finite in linearized field equations. And I will also check uh, the mess of the numerical black holes with this, uh, with this uh, stress energy tensor. And finally, I will conclude. So let's start with the Lipschitz space times. And a great deal of these non-relativistic systems exhibit this dynamical scaling. And with dynamical scaling, what I mean by is time and spatial parts of the metric and time of the, and spatial parts of the space time does not scale the same. For example, in this one, for z greater than one, time and scale, uh, time and spatial parts scale differently. And following this, uh, motivated by this idea and motivated by the uh, gauge gravity duality, people started looking at space times exhibiting these uh, symmetries. Okay, and they come up with the Lipschitz space times in these. Uh, one to three papers, they are cl quite close to each other uh, with respect to their time. And if you demand this set of generators, like for example, B is the dilatations, M is the rotations, the classic, and P is the translations. Note that there, there are no Galilean uh, boosts here. You will lead to these Lipschitz space times, okay? And for those of you who haven't seen before, and this is actually quite similar to ADS, ADS space time, but the difference is Z equals here, Z should be different than one. Then you will have Lipschitz space times and, but geometrically this has many, many differences with uh, ADS space time, which I'm not going to discuss it today, but it has some problems like, uh, yeah, it has some problems, but I'm not going to discuss this today. And as a side note, if you extend these symmetries to include Galilean boost, you will have Schrodinger space times, which is also another uh, discussion topic. So let's come to models for Lipschitz. What kind of space times I have uh, as a model for the, that admits Lipschitz as a solution? So uh, as well known, this cosmological Einstein theory like the ADS one does not admit Lipschitz. So you need something else, you need matter, class or some higher curvature terms. But in this talk, I will focus on the matter couplings since the higher curvature terms are quite, uh, at the boundary, they are quite hard to handle because there is, as far as I know, there is no way to uh, give some variational well-defined action like with Dirichlet boundary conditions and so on. So I will just focus on the matter coupling. And the most studied one is the following, the, uh, the starting one is, this one, so you have uh, two, the two form and a three form coupled to each other. And this admits a Lipschitz solution. And later this was shown to be equal to, you can integrate the three form 
and at four dimensions you have this proca action. So this proca action is actually quite nice because it has nice properties. It is first of all it is quite simple to study, uh, and it has actually quite nice properties related with the uh, compactifications and so on because these churn simons couplings and massive vector fields usually arise in string theory compactification. So you have a relation with the higher dimensions. And what else? Yeah, and this spherical compactification is indeed exploited to show the Lifshitz holography is related at the boundary. You will have some kind of theory with or geometry, something called Newton Cartan geometry with a specific torsion tensor, right? And this was studied, this Broca model studied in detail in these papers and some more papers and the group in Denmark, I think. Yeah, Oberst and Hartung, they studied this torsional Newton Cartan stuff and so on. So this Broca model was quite uh, simple and nice to study. And one more thing about this model, and uh, one more thing about the Lifshitz first is, so normally you have for the onto the stair, you can use this uh, Pfefferman Graham expansion where you can you have an asymptotic expansion near the boundary, and you can use this expansion to relate these vacuum expectation values, energy stress tensor, and conformal anomalies, and so on. But the bad thing about Lifshitz is you don't have this in Lifshitz, so you cannot use Pfefferman Graham expansion, and because of that you have some troubles defining the quantities. And what these guys used in Proca was, so they basically start in a 10 dimensional supergravity action and they reduce it uh, in these three papers. They reduce it by using from Robin compactification. They reduce it to a five dimensional model. The good thing is this five dimensional model has an ADS solution, right? So this has an ADS solution and Pfefferman Graham expansion. So you can do all the things you need to do with holography. You can find energy stress tensors and so on. That is good. And the better thing is this five dimensional model has also one more, you can compactify one more on the chi, uh, let's say this field chi has a translation invariance. So you can compactify one more and get you a four dimensional model. And this has also a Lifshitz solution with Z equals two. So the good thing is, you know, the five dimensional ADS solution and you can do holography and you also have a relation with the compactification at the four dimensional. So you can relate five dimensional and four dimensional fields through a map and you can find the geometry on the Lifshitz side. So that is one good thing about Proca. So you can use compactification and you can study the Lifshitz holography as you did in the ADS one. And for the related people, if you want to read more, these two theses are pretty good from the, uh, from the Denmark group. Anyway, so my main motivation, let's go back to the einstein young Miss case. So I discussed the Proca and my main motivation to come back to einstein young Miss problem was I had the time. And the second was these uh, two groups from Argentina and Chile, they start, uh, started studying these things called holographic flat bands and these, in this model, they they use it, uh, they use Einstein Young Miss uh, solution I found before. So they use this 2014 solution, and I, I thought, yeah, it is time to go back to this solution and explore it more. I mean, find the energy and try to define, uh, try to find the thermodynamics of the black holes I found before. And okay, so. That was the main motivation for me. And let's go to the review of this Einstein Young Miss solution. Here, this is the 2014 solution. And I have this following action. So the Einstein plus the usual Young Miss part, right? The simplest Young Miss uh, coupling. And here I have SU2 gauge fields. And I have capital Greek letters for uh, the group index, one to three and mu nu for the space, uh, the whole curved indices. And this tau, these t's are generators and tau's are Pauli matrices. So they have, they satisfy these properties. And the field equation are, as usual, you have the energy momentum tensor, which, which has the trace zero. And you can nicely use this uh, conformal property. I mean, the trace is zero. So, you can find the uh, cosmological constant from, from that trace, right? 
So setting trace equals to zero, you can find the cosmological constant. And you also uh, assume that you have a Lipschitz solution of this form. Not that I have uh, taken time. I, I have a weird kind of a convention. I push the radial part to the, to, the, to the end because I'm going to take the boundary from the radial direction. So this is, uh, I mean, the, for example, the zero component is time. One, two component are the plane, planar ones, X1 and X2 or X and Y. The third one is, will be the radial one. And for the rest of the solution to find the gauge field, you need the gauge field, planar gauge field, young me sounds that. And you can follow these uh, for space-time symmetric gauge fields. You can follow these references, which are pretty good. And the basic idea is what they do is they, they use the gauge um, uh, transformation properties of the gauge vectors like this. And they also use these Cs are the space-time symmetries. So you try to mix them together through a lead derivative. And you take the lead derivative of the gauge field, then the right-hand side, this omega is kind of a gauge function. So it is not zero because a mu is a gauge field. Then you, you can play around with these uh, lead brackets and you can write down consistency conditions and you can find the uh, most general symmetric ansatz. But you can also follow this, these papers, right? So uh, you can follow these young misfields and invariant under Poincare group. And you, you will see that your ansatz will be something like this. There will be some electric part Q and there will be only one function and they're, they're on the X1 and X2 coordinates. So if you write down the young miss vector, let's say like this, you will have only one function on the planar ones and there is there will be a Q, an electric one, right? This, these R's are magnetic functions, let's say, and Q is the electric one. And for the solution, I will set for the full Lipschitz solution, I will set Q equals to zero. Then I can find this solution easily. This is the Lipschitz space time and R, the gauge field function should be plus minus sigma R. Sigma is just a constant, which is square root of Z plus one. And the gauge coupling here, G young means coupling is one over two Z plus one and Z minus one. And you might ask what happens at Z equals one. So at Z equals one, uh, G young, young means goes to infinity. But if, if you remember from the action, the G young means was appearing like one over G young means, right? So this will decouple, right? At Z equals one, G young means goes to infinity. And this makes uh, you have it, on the left hand side, you have the Einstein, and on the right hand side, you have Young Mies, and they are decoupled. So there is no problem on the z equals one side. Right. So this was the solution. And lambda is something z dependent. So this is an exact solution. And on the 2014 paper, I studied the numerical black holes for this one. And I will come to that if I have time. And this solution was later extended to five dimensions. And so we have now four dimensional and five dimensional solutions uh, by Lu and Fan. And they also discuss some uh, exact solutions to these, not the pure Einstein Young Miss one, but they couple some extra meter fields and find some uh, exact solutions. But the problem with the Einstein Young, pure young, Einstein young Miss is there is only numerical solutions, numerical black holes. And the cool thing with this Einstein Young Mies solution is it is actually related, interestingly related to higher dimensions. And this is a paper by Pope from 84 or 85. So it is a 30 or 40 year old paper. And he showed that these Einstein Young Mies equations have a solution like this solution can be generated from uh, D equals 11 supergravity by uh, dimensional reduction. So, but this solution is, is for some Z specific value of Z, it is like irrational value. I think it was one plus square root of three. So the problem you can ask is, can you use this embedding like the massive vector model they did in uh, einstein Proker case? So maybe it is possible. So that is one question for me. And let's come to the variational well-defined action. So for the uh, variation, you should consider the variation of this model. Yeah, so the Einstein and Miss model. And when you vary this, you will have the, at the boundary field equations plus some boundary terms, right? The first boundary term is 
related with the gravity side. The second one is uh, the young me side. The first one is you can kill this one. I mean, uh, the, for the Drishle conditions, you should use Hawking Gibbons term, right? Which is well known. But for space times with non compact spatial section, this is, this is not enough. I mean, you add the Hawking Gibbons, but you need some extra counter terms to also make this variation zero on shell. Okay, the rule is you should make the delta S on. Uh, zero on the field equations, I'm, I mean, on the solutions, not the field equations, on the solutions. So you need some boundary counter terms. And the things you might try is not too much because of the gauge invariances. And so you should add the, the following. The 2K is Hawking Gibbons. K zero is some constant uh, which we should find. And alpha times trace of this FAB, FAB is the boundary, uh, boundary boundary young means field. So you should find this K0 and alpha. And it is quite easy to find. If you vary these boundary pieces, you will see that this looks complicated, but the first one is, the first one, this piece cancels out the Hawking Gibbons term, uh, the, the derivative term, and the rest are just the young means pieces and the other pieces. So if you gather them all around, you will have the metric variation times SAB, SAB is this guy which is the matter part plus the canonical, like something like canonical momenta and SA lambda is the matter part. So remember we were going to find alpha and K zero in the action. So for K zero equals to minus Z plus three and alpha is equal to this thing, Z minus one plus Z plus whatever this is. The full variation is zero on shell. So you make the, now you have a Dirichlet problem plus a well-defined Dirichlet problem because uh, your variation is zero on shell. And the final action should be something like this. It is, it is not too complicated. It's just the young miss part plus some Hawking Gibbons term plus this piece, uh, which will help you to make the variation zero on shell. And yeah, the boundary term on the Maxwell one is quite different than this one, but this one is not gauge invariant for, for the uh, young means case, so you might forget about this one. And let's go back to the boundary stress tensor. So we define the variation well defined action, and we now have a boundary stress tensor. So for the boundary stress tensor, normally uh, I will follow this. A Ross and Sarami, Sarami description. And normally if you have only uh, metric is the non-trivial non boundary field on the theory, you will have this well-known stress tensor, right? So you need to vary the action with respect to the boundary metric. And this is a 99 paper from Krauss and Balas. And, but however, if you have something other than scalars, like extra matter fields, you should consider the Holland's Ishibashi and Marov uh, boundary stress tensor, which is kind of modified. So instead of the boundary metric, you should consider boundary field binds, okay? EAM, EAB. And this is the paper, 2005 paper. Then it is possible to write down any boundary tensor, like for example, some gauge field or some tensor field here as a, you, you, you might project them with the field binds, right? So then your, your stress tensor is instead of this metric variation, you should look at the uh, field bind variation. Then you can see that the, uh, you can define the stress tensor as follows, like the variation of the, uh, variation of the field bind. And this stress tensor is now, is not zero on the right hand side you will have some terms like this but remember this was still on the relativistic side this is a 2005 paper and this is about the holograph uh, the ads cft stuff when you have matter you should go to this one and on the non-relativistic side you will have energy density energy flux uh, momentum density and spatial stress right so you lose the covariance and if you have some non-relativistic thing you should have these components and these guys will satisfy the following conservation. It is like the decomposition of the covariant one, right? So this is the energy part. 
this is the momentum. And finally, for the leaf sheets, this is important. This should be satisfied. Z times the energy should be equal to trace of the spatial stress tensor. So this is because of the scale invariance, right? All invariances will give you some conservation laws. And this is the one for scale, scale invariance. And the main idea between this ROS and ceramic construction is just take the, try to take the non-relativistic limit of the previous one I showed you, this Hollands, Ishibashi, and Marov one. The same thing, you, you will study with the field binds. And, but the one difference is that you should take these field binds as follows. You should take the R to the Z and R components outside, and you should work with these headed ones. Okay, just the difference is this, and this will make you give you a finite, hopefully finite stress energy tensor. So uh, this is one rule you should follow. And I mean, you should rescale these guys with R to the Z and R. And the other one is then the Lifshitz solution will be something like this. As R goes to infinity, this E hat is the R. It should be DT, sorry about this. And EI should be DXI. Okay, then, so, uh, sorry, five minutes left. Yeah, okay. uh, five minutes, okay, okay. So, um, and you can uh, crank the machinery and you can find this energy stress tensor, right? So you, now you, instead of one stress tensor, you have actually one, two, three, four components. And these S things are things on the boundary, right? I have de defined these before. Now I have the, stress energy tensor and I should show them, I should show you this is finite for linear perturbations and finite for the numerical vehicles. For the linear perturbations, I can just, I will just quickly show you this, uh, discuss this perturbation analysis. So you can, as I don't have any exact solutions, I should go to first perturbation analysis, then look for the numerical solutions. And for the perturbation analysis, you need to divide the perturbations into vector and scalar vector and tensor components, right? And here by constant perturbations, I mean time first, I look at time independent perturbations, then I look for the time dependent perturbations. And for this perturbation analysis, you can write down the orthonormal phase as follows and writing this this looks quite complicated, but it is not. You, you just follow the, uh, there, are, there are three rules. So for the perturbations, as R goes to infinity, perturbations should go to zero. And you should be able to write down the perturbations as scalar vector and tensor components. This is the second one. And the third one is from the uh, Ishibashi and Holland's uh, uh, tensor definition. On the flat indices, I mean, when you project with the field binds, the uh, the solution go, should go to a constant one. And once you follow this thing, you can easily write down the perturbations as follows. I, I just flashed you this thing. So the perturbations on the gauge field side is something like this. This V2i are the perturbations, Bij's are the perturbations, and Hij's are the perturbations. So you have several components for the gauge field and several components for the field binds. Then, if you put these perturbations in the action and in the energy momentum tensor, you will have uh, this action and this energy momentum tensor, right? But now uh, the thing is you should solve these uh, linearized equations, right? To find the finite versions of these guys. And the finite versions will be, uh, when you put them into linearized equations, you can find the finite versions easily, I will just show you the results. So you solve the linearized equations and the action is just finite, which is something four times C1 is some constant times this guy. And the energy is just this one. So that uh, when you solve also the vector and tensor modes, you can do the same thing. You just go through linearized equations and solve this and you will find the energy flux and the momentum density, right? So two things. and which are all, again, finite. And we are all competing these at the uh, R goes to infinity case. Then you can go also the tensor modes and find the spatial stress tensor components, which is good. 
Then finally, you need to check these word identities, right? The things you find should satisfy these word identities, which are the time components. Uh, you cannot show this one. These are trivially satisfied because they depend on time. But the last one is scale invariance word identity. And you can show that this is satisfied. So there is no problem. Everything is finite and the word identity is satisfied. And I also check the time dependent word identities and they seem to, uh, uh, they all satisfy these first two equations also. So there is no problem and everything works fine. And for the, ah, I don't have much time, but if you give me two minutes, I can show you the numerical black holes also. So for the numerical black holes, you should go to, uh, you should take this metric, right? F and G, you plug in some uh, functions into um, your metric and you try to solve the equations numerically like this. And this was a thing I did in 2014. And I showed that these are the gauge field functions, H and J, and they all go to one, which tells you that at one, you have the Lifshitz asymptotic. So these are uh, the gauge field functions for the H and J are the gauge field functions for the uh, numerical solution. And F and G are the gauge field function, uh, sorry, metric functions for the numerical solution. So you have a numerical solution, black hole solution. And this is a black hole. You can calculate the temperature and so on. But we, I did not have the mass for this one before. And now with this uh, stress energy tensor, now I can calculate the mass, and which I did. And I, give, I find the final res, uh, finite results. So at R goes to infinity at large distances, you reach a final, final result. And you can show that since these are static black holes, there is no time dependence, they should satisfy this uh, Z times epsilon, this scaling word identity, right? And you can show that this is satisfied. So Z times epsilon is this one, this numerical value, and this uh, spatial part is this, this one. So they are close in terms of numerical calculation. So there's no problem on this one. And finally, the, you can show the thermodynamics is also satisfied and you can follow the thermodynamics from uh, and it's, then it's, can I just ask about numerical precision there? That doesn't look like a close result to me. Oh. Um, like it, this how one, many decimal points is that? That's like a two decimal points. You have a, a discrepancy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Uh, I mean, four, yeah. Yeah, you, you yeah. are. I, I don't know what's going on, but this is, this is not, yeah, very convincing. No, uh, you say so? Yeah. Well, you, did, did your referee find this convincing? Yeah, for the numerical guys, I mean, in, in before and this paper, they said the numerical guys, this is okay. So referee said it is okay, but I thought it was okay. So for, I'm not an expert on numerics. Okay, okay. So, no, it just looks, I mean, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't expect these. I mean, I expect uh, the agreement to much higher. Uh, much definition. higher precision. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe I should go more precise things uh, more precise plots or I should be more okay, precise. Okay, okay, anyway, anyway, hey, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And the thermodynamics is as follows. I mean, you can follow the uh, Professor Mons and Miox paper on this one. And thermodynamics should follow uh, this, this uh, relation for the Lifshitz black holes and the first law, accompanying first law. And the first law says, I will just quickly show that energy should scale as R zero is the horizon radius and Z to the Z plus two. So what I did was for the first law, I just showed that the masses goes like uh, satisfy this polynomial relation, right? So I, on the X axis, there are radius, uh, horizon radius, and on the Y, there is this energy. And I just show this is R to the four, R to the five and R to the six. And the, the other thing, the other relation is again, probably, yeah, this is uh, what I showed was this Z plus two epsilon should be equal to two TS. What I did was just divide them to each other and show that they all give at least the similar, the same result. Uh, they are not probably, there are some factors of uh, constants around. So they are not one, but they are something uh, they, are, they are the same thing, 
at least. And yeah, this is the end. But but this shows is finally is the solutions I found numerically are uh, Hayri solutions because this uh, thermodynamic relation does not include any charge or whatever. So there is no global charge. And this makes also the claim by Fan and Lu correct. And yeah, these are the conclusions. And thank you for listening. Okay. So any question? So I'll just one. So if not, then uh, let's send Dennis to again hit for his very nice talk. So yeah, so we resume at uh